My daughter, who was a senior in high school, came down with a bad case of psoriasis. Uh, she was going to a dermatologist who was treating her, and she'd been through a number of treatments, and nothing was working. Uh, and so finally I said to him, who is the leading psoriasis expert in New York City? And he said, it's uh, Dr. Martin Carter at uh, Rockefeller University. As part of her treatment, she wound up spending a month in the hospital the first time. And uh, I remember I went over to pick her up at, at the end of her month in the hospital, and I said to the nurse, where do I go to pay the bill? The nurse said, there's no, there's no charge, it's a research hospital. And so I went back to my office and I got out my checkbook and I sent a check to Marty Carter for what I thought a month in the hospital would cost. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, about two weeks later, I got a call from the chairman of the board of Rockefeller who said he'd like to come over and see me. And uh, that was the beginning of what now has been a 20 year relationship with the, uh, with the university. October 26, 1910. It's the day that this hospital opened its doors to the public. Rockefeller had an advisor named Gates, whose observation was that we'd reached this, the point in the state of medicine where you could diagnose what was wrong with people, uh, but we had no ability to, to stop the disease that they had from killing them. So Gates came up with the idea of bringing together the best and the brightest uh, in one location to basically study how do we interact with disease and how do we stop disease. So he tried to persuade Mr. Rockefeller that this would be a good thing to do. Mr. Rockefeller was not so immediately persuaded, but after the death of his first grandson, a dear little boy who was very close to John Rockefeller, within a week of that death, the letter went from Rockefeller Sr. to his son to say that research institute that Gates has spoken about, let's do that and let's make sure there's a hospital on the premises where the sick can come and be treated, of course, but also be studied. The hospital found a remarkable man named Rufus Cole who was fully committed to the concept of the scientists being the physicians taking care of the patients. Pneumonia killed 25% of the people who had it. The pneumococcal pneumonia became the issue of study. Cole brought in a collaborator named Oswald Avery. Avery worked on this for many years, left alone in this hospital, which permitted him to do what seemed to be a very obscure, uncertain kind of research. And in 1944, he published a paper the title of which incorporated the idea that the genetic principle of all biology and living systems, deoxyribonucleic acid, the DNA, is the chemical agent of the gene. Probably the single most important experiment in biology of the 20th century. If nothing else ever happened in this hospital, that one story and that one experiment made the entire endeavor worthwhile. Before Rockefeller was formed in 1910, there was no idea of patients in a bed for research purposes only. Hospitals were there to care for people, which is a wonderful goal. But we had no way of investigating patients in beds until Rockefeller was formed. Indeed, the entire idea of the uh, clinical center at the National Institutes of Health starts with Rockefeller. Remember that this was the birthplace of American biomedical science, and by the late 1930s, Dr. Hirsch has estimated that nearly one half of the chairman of departments of medicine around the country had trained at the hospital. Of course, one of the re remarkable achievements of the university is the fact that, that 23 members of the university have received the Nobel Prize. And when I've heard about it, I've called them up and come over to see them. The Rockefeller University Hospital is different. It's totally dedicated to research. So that means that all the investigators that work in it really have the time to pursue their ideas uh, on the uh, origins of disease and ways to develop new treatments. 
When the AIDS epidemic arrived, it took us several years till we decided that our research could bear upon the AIDS problem. So we've taken something from a discovery that was novel, incredibly novel here, my mentor's discovery of dendritic cells, and we've translated it into a modality of vaccine to prevent HIV. Rockefeller is important to what we're doing because it's one of the only places in the world that actually prizes risk-taking and has allowed us to do completely improbable scientific experiments that we just wouldn't be allowed to do at any other university. This one, I think. My lab is obsessed with trying to understand the relationship between genes and behavior, and the big behavior that we have been studying is the sense of smell. Mosquito disease transmission is a, an enormous problem in the developing world. Malaria kills a million people a year. Several hundred million people are sick and infected with the malaria parasite. We plan to enroll people in the Rockefeller Hospital to try to find out what that substance is that's either attracting or repelling mosquitoes. And that substance, if bottled, could be an incredibly important tool in preventing mosquito disease transmission. I came to the Rockefeller University to do a research elective in 64. I joined Professor Dole, who was also joined with Leighton Marie Nice Wonder. In the first six months of 1964, we did all the original basic clinical research in the Rockefeller Hospital, which led to the development of methadone maintenance treatment. Now there are over one million persons in treatment worldwide, including persons in Iran, China, throughout Europe, and throughout, of course, the United States and Canada. Every patient in the hospital is a research patient, and all the staff are geared to taking care of research patients. So the research nurses are invaluable to the success of the clinical studies. In terms of face-to-face -face contact, oftentimes patients spend more time with the nurses than with the actual investigators. We have to have an environment where there's no stigma, no one saying, you junkie. No one is saying, go sit over there. Everyone is saying, oh, we're so glad you're here. Thank you for helping us with our research. Ongoing research at Rockefeller really has the potential to have a major impact on the way medicine is practiced. It's possible uh, now for scientists very rapidly to uh, take their findings from the laboratory and think about applying them to uh, human disease. The hospital enables that. Rockefeller is a step ahead of other academic institutions that don't have this unique asset, this resource. Biomedical research is our only focus when we're here, as opposed to being at a large medical center where often your research competes with the time that's spent in clinical care. Rockefeller is second to none in providing that protected time. Obviously, I'm very thankful for the investment that Rockefeller has made in me. You know, as part of the Clinical Scholars Program, I had three years of protected time. That gave me enough time to focus on my research, generate data. Now I'm an NIH-funded investigator, and that was uh, not a small accomplishment, and I could do it thanks to the investment that Rockefeller made. My own laboratory studies a rare group of patients who, amazingly enough, have an immune response against their own cancers. And by bringing those patients into the Rockefeller Hospital, we're able to discover something that people haven't seen before, which is human beings have a natural ability to get rid of cancer. Studying these patients not only teaches us insights about how an important phenomenon can happen, but is giving us insights into basic biology that we never dreamed of. And all of this work is only possible if we get willing volunteers. The dedication of the hundreds of people who've come in to do this is really amazing. Patient-oriented research is what we do. It's always been our number one priority. It always will be our number one priority. There is nothing else that competes with it. I think we have an outstanding opportunity here. We have a small institution with world-class people in it. And I think we need to continue to think aggressively about what else we can be doing at Rockefeller and, and how do we expand beyond our current scientific horizons. My family have been involved in a number of enormously worthwhile philanthropies. Uh, 
But I believe that perhaps the most significant is the Rockefeller University and the Rockefeller Hospital in, in that connection. I think going back uh, even to grandfather and father, they would probably agree with that, that those who have worked in it uh, have been remarkable people. Rockefeller is just an incredibly exciting uh, place to be for uh, biomedical research because of the strength of the basic sciences on the one hand and the commitment that's always existed here to taking that knowledge and translating it into medicines that can help patients. This is really the golden age of um, disease research, translational medicine and drug discovery and I think that medicine is going to be transformed profoundly in all of those different areas. I believe that there will always be a need for a high quality research facility in which thoughtful scientists and physicians can study human biology and individual patients' responses to new therapies. Somebody asked me, well, how can you keep talking about Rockefeller? You don't even work there. You're at Harvard. What's that all about? And uh, I once said uh, to a group there, well, I guess it sounds a little bit like Macy's complimenting gimbals. Uh, <laughs> and most people don't understand what I mean when I say that anymore. But I do feel that it is a place that sets a standard. It is my single most important philanthropic association. It's an institution that has had a large impact on my family. Uh, it's been a very important place to me for a long time. I am totally honored to be chairman of the board. And it's a place that I think the world of and you know, want to do as much as I can to help.